Welcome to the Baker Institute. Um, I'm Alan Mattiso, the Associate Director, and I'm very pleased to, um, to um, host the event tonight, which is a special event. Our speaker um, is the uh, ambassador from the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, His Excellency uh, Azid um, Ahmad um, uh, Ershadouri. Um, the ambassador has had a 36-year career as a distinguished diplomat. He served in Doha and, and in Cairo. He's uh, held important positions at the United Nations. He's been the ambassador uh, to the Nether Netherlands. Uh, he's been the foreign secretary um, of Pakistan from 2013 to the beginning of this year. And in March of 2017, he became uh, the ambassador to the United States. Um, the relationship between the United States and Pakistan is, of course, uh, a crucial relationship for both countries, um, especially uh, as the, as the uh, American um, involvement in South Asia uh, deepens. This is a relationship that um, has had its difficulties. It may be entering a, a tense period, but um, that relationship remains what it has been uh, since the founding uh, of Pakistan in 1947. It's a relationship of allies. Uh, and we are very pleased uh, to have the ambassador here today um, to help us understand that relationship. And I am very pleased, sir, uh, to welcome you to the podium. Please uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming uh, to this uh, event this evening. It is my proud privilege. I am deeply honored, humbled by your presence here. Uh, let, me, let me say that uh, I am also new uh, in my assignment yet. It's been only uh, two months that I've been in, uh, in my post. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, the government of Pakistan chose me to come to the United States because this is a country I got to know uh, over the years as a country with great uh, people, great values, uh, and, you know, some a country that has earned a lot of respect in Pakistan for the leadership role that your country has played. Uh, for, the, for the resilience that your nation and your people have shown, but above all for the values that have come to define this relationship, that have come to endear your country uh, with our country, the values that your founding fathers gave you and which have kept your country together and, and, and let it thrive. I'm referring to the values of uh, uh, democracy, freedom, liberty, rule of law, justice, fair play, and, and these are the values which the people of Pakistan also yearn and, and, uh, and like to associate with. So that's what your country represents to us, uh, to our people. I am also happy uh, that I was posted to the United States because I have had some previous experiences in this country. I graduated from Tufts University uh, way back in 1989, 90 and then came back to serve in this embassy in which I am now heading uh, for a year before I moved out to New York where I spent good six years plus working in our mission to the United Nations. So in that sense, it's, it's my fourth term uh, in, the, in the U.S. And in the process, my family, uh, you know, got to live in the United States. My children grew up here. Uh, and uh, they enjoyed it, and they have uh, grown up with the uh, with the United States that I'm mentioning about, with the values of the United States. They have studied in your education system, and they can see what makes the United States what it is today. So I am very, very pleased that I am uh, back to this environment. And I'm also happy because the Prime Minister, after having served 
as foreign secretary, I could have gone perhaps closer home or somewhere else, but he thought that I should go back to the United States and, and carry the message that this country means a lot to Pakistan, that we, we care for this, for this partnership, that we uh, would like to have a strong, deeper, closer, uh, cooperative and friendly partnership with the United States, which we have. Uh, as I would uh, go through uh, various elements. I've also, uh, ever since I came here, I've gone through different uh, uh, circles of influence, if you can, can call them, or centers of influence, or anchors of influence, which define the city of uh, Washington in the District of Columbia. Uh, it's very different capital from all other capitals because you not only deal with the executive, which you do, you must, but you also deal with the legislature, you deal with the think tanks, media, academia, uh, even the diaspora. So it makes your job very interesting while you are in DC. So when I was circuiting around during these last two months, I noticed that perceptions about Pakistan were lagging behind the reality of today's Pakistan. The reality of today's Pakistan was changing, actually changing rapidly and changing, in, uh, changing I would say, by the month. Now, what is that reality which is, which is changing? I would say that uh, uh, Pakistan, which had uh, come to partner with the United States for a long, long time, uh, from the 60s uh, to 80s to 2000s after 9-11, came into the grip of terrorism and the extremist elements right after 9-11. Right after 9-11, uh, when Pakistan decided to join the international coalition against all these elements, especially Al-Qaeda, we became a legitimate victim, uh, a, a legitimate target in their eyes, and they started attacking Pakistan's cities, installations, schools, and what have you. And we started, uh, a big debate started within the country as to how to deal with these terrorist elements. Uh, we worked together with the United States. We were able to eliminate Al-Qaeda by and large, but still there were quite a few uh, other uh, affiliated organizations and, and, and terrorist elements which stayed back. Now, they had spread a very weird narr narrative, a flawed narrative they had spread around. The narrative was that, look, Afghanistan was under occupation when it was occupied by Soviet Union. It got knocked out, and now this time it is occupied by Americans, and therefore it needs to be resisted, and it needs to be sanctified as a holy struggle called jihad. Now, this was a flawed narrative. This was flawed because when you kill people, innocent people, on the streets and in the schools, and in the marketplaces, that is no holy duty. That is no jihad. So they were only using the name of Islam, which calls strictly for, uh, for uh, you know, security and for peace. Uh, that was being used, misused actually, by these people, and where they were creating all kinds of um, barbaric terrorism. So somebody had to do something about it. So the politicians, luckily, uh, a couple of years back, got together, held a series of political uh, parties, conferences, and we were able to evolve a consensus that violence of any kind, terrorism under any pretext, is not justified. Once we had that consensus under our belt, which was somewhere around 2014, that encouraged our military forces to move into the tribal areas. Now, these tribal areas, uh, do I have a pointer here? Do I? Does it work? No, all right, forget. Uh, yeah, so these, these tribal areas which straddle between Afghanistan and Pakistan all along that border, a rugged area, uh, which had deliberately been kept those of you as history buffs would recall, had been deliberately kept by the Russian Empire and the British India as, a, as an area which was sort of buffer zone between them. It hadn't seen the kind of governance which the regular settled areas had seen. It had the Malik system, which was working fine, but when the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, after Tora Bora was bombed heavily, came into that area, they knocked the Maliks out. And they 
in, uh, you know, came to dig into that area. They built hideouts. They built uh, IED factories. They built sanctuaries, safe havens, what have you. And they became a source of terrorism that would not only affect Afghanistan but also Pakistan. So that that they had to be taken out, but we were waiting for that consensus which happened in June of 2014 and then military moved in. And because we were able to underwrite that consensus against terrorism of any kind and every kind in every form and every manifestation, the military had a huge and remarkable success in liberating the entire tribal areas uh, from these uh, militants and from these terrorists. Now once we, uh, of course it didn't come at no easy cost. We paid a huge cost. 5,000 soldiers and officers had to lay down their lives in order to get that liberation. But it only steeled our resolve. We became even more convinced that there was no way that we can allow Pakistan and the people of Pakistan a hostage to these terrorists whose worldview we never share. And therefore, we were very pleased that it has happened now. Now every inch of that territory is under uh, Pakistan's control. 95% of the people who had been displaced by these militants have gone back. They are stitching together their lives. They are building their shops, schools, hospitals, roads. And I want to tell you that in this reconstruction, Pakistan and United States are working together. There are a large number of roads, dams, water reservoirs, uh, and schools, and many other areas in which Pakistan and United States have worked together to bring these people back to their normal life because they had suffered a lot from, from, uh, from the activities of these militants. So we, we are now in the process of bringing a political package to that area to, uh, to merge them with the settled area so that they begin to see the same kind of democratic governance which is available to the rest of the country. So it's a, it's a defining moment in history because we are sort of rewriting the history. An area for centuries which had not seen the kind of governance is today is becoming a normal, regular part of the country. So we are very pleased about that. Now once these people ran away from them, some of them went to Afghanistan, the others came and hid themselves in the uh, in the urban centers of, of the rest of the country. So another operation has now been launched which is called Raddul Fasad. Fasad is a word which be, means mischief. And so these people are now being calmed out of, uh, of those uh, places where they are hiding uh, through intelligence-based operations and things are looking up. Uh, we, the people of Pakistan are very excited uh, that they have reversed the tide of terrorism in a time and in a region which is still grappling with the, with the forces of terrorism. So with this reversal, we, uh, we have also began to see a, a, a sense of uh, security prevailing in the country and law and order improving. Remember, only until three years ago, in, by 2014, between 20, 2006 and 2014, we used to have on the average 150 terrorist incidents per month. Now that number, that was the number, that is, was the mighty challenge. Today, it is less than the fingers of a single hand. And so that's the kind of thing that we have shown. And as a result of that, it has had a salutary effect on the economic situation of the country. The economy is begin, beginning to pick up. Uh, our growth rates were 4.7% last year. The World Bank has just revised it upward to 5.3%. We are told that it could go to 6% by the end of next year, So, which is, which is a good news for us. The fiscal deficits are down. Uh, foreign exchange reserves are up. Stock market is actually booming. Uh, credit ratings have, you know, which were negative, have moved on to stable, to positive. Uh, a number of good indications are coming out. Price Waterhouse Cooper uh, came out with a, sto with a uh, report about three months back, saying that Pakistan's economy could be po could be within the top 20 economies by 2030. Uh, Goldman Sachs said that it could happen as early as 2025. Uh, we have also had a series of reports from Forbes and Bloomberg and many others, um, and that has created a sort of optimism in the air in Pakistan, and which is now attracting investors. Investors are flocking to Pakistan. Uh, of course, first and foremost is uh, China, 
which is bringing in billions, up um, perhaps 60 billion plus. But so are the Turks and the Koreans and the Europeans, mainly Germans and the, and the Brits. But what pleases me most as ambassador of Pakistan to your great country uh, is that corporate America is now deeply getting deeply interested. There are a large number of companies. In fact, hats off to a company, a Houston-based company, which led the charge about three years back when we were still not there. We are still fighting, but they could see that this is a fight that this country is going to win. So they were a, Accelerate Energy went there and put up a floating LNG plant there to get, to to gas uh, you know to gasify it and pump it into our system. And ever since, there are a number of companies. General Electric has gone there, Exxon Mobil has gone there, Procter and Gamble has gone there, PepsiCo is there. A large number of companies are now uh, uh, moving towards Pakistan, which which shows because ordinary people are not able to see beyond the TV screens every day, but these companies can because that's their business. They need to see uh, what ordinary people cannot. So they, that's what is going on. And that's the part of the story I was indicating and referring to, ladies and gentlemen, was not in keeping with the perceptions that sometimes come to define uh, uh, you know, the misperceptions about a country. Uh, a word or two, let me say, about uh, United States, our relations with the United States, very, very important, extremely important. Pakistan and United States have worked together. And whenever we work together, both countries benefit, benefited. You would recall during the 50s and 60s, when the entire world order created after post-World War was under threat from a new force that emerged. I'm sure you all understand what I mean. It was Pakistan and United States which worked together. In the 80s, when Afghanistan was under occupation from Soviet forces, and there was a fear that this could expand, again Pakistan and United States came together. And we made it work. After 9-11, when these Al-Qaeda and other horrible groups got together to challenge the world, once again Pakistan and United States worked together and we decimated Al-Qaeda. Today, you don't talk about it. You don't talk about it because it doesn't exist anymore. Some of its perverted versions are there, like ISIS and others, but Al-Qaeda we solidly defeated together. So it's, it's my message uh, to my American audience that Pakistan and United States must stay engaged. They must work together. And there is a solid agenda that needs to be worked together. The top of the list of that agenda is how to stabilize Afghanistan. I believe that Pakistan has a genuine vested national interest to see Afghanistan stabilize. Because all these gains that we have made in the security domain and in the economic domain could be at risk. Could be at risk if Afghanistan is not stable. We have seen, and history has shown us, that whenever Afghanistan was unstable, the instability permeates through those that open borders and into Pakistan. So we have every reason to be worried about instability in Afghanistan. The security situation there, unfortunately, has deteriorated. And therefore, we would like to work with the United States and whoever else that we need to work together to bring Afghanistan back to stability. We believe that United, in an independent, sovereign, peaceful, stable, prosperous Afghanistan is the, in the direct national interest of Pakistan. And we also believe that the United States is also wanting to see Afghanistan stabilize. There is a very solid reason for that. I was earlier talking to Alan that the United States has also invested billions in economic terms and in military terms in Afghanistan since 9-11. And you would have a genuine interest to bring this longest war that the United States is fighting to a logical conclusion. 
So we do see a congruity, a congruence of interest between Pakistan and congruence of interest between the United States, a real solid reason for us to work together to stabilize Afghanistan for our own respective reasons. And by working together, I'm sure we can do that. Another reason we believe that Pakistan and the United States must continue to work together is the growing threat of Daesh and ISIS, which has not yet been conquered from Syria and Iraq, while that theater still continues, many of these elements have crept into Afghanistan. More regional players are going, coming into Afghanistan and getting interested there. So there's every reason for Pakistan and the United States to continue to work together and finish what we did together after 9-11. And the third area where we believe we are already talking to the new uh, government also is the area of economic ties, trade ties and, and investment relations. So that's another area. We believe that would be the best way if we can build stakes of the two countries in a good relation and a solid relation between the two countries. And nothing better than the investors and traders who actually build those stakes in the durability of that relationship. So we are working on it, it's making progress, and I think we would like to continue to make every effort to deepen our ties with your country, to strengthen this partnership, and that's the mandate that I have received from my government. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I thought I'll pause, I promised uh, Ellen that I'll pause after about 30 minutes, not more than that, because it's the, in the question answers that you enjoy most. I, I get my learning mostly from questions answer. Please, no holds barred, uh, ask any questions, and of course, I'll be very happy to, uh, to respond. Thank you very much. Uh, 50 to 20 years ago, Pakistan was not the most stable place. Yet, uh, they had nuclear weapons, and somehow they didn't manage to get the United States upset about that. How did they achieve that? I still don't understand. <laughs> All right. Uh, there are two ways to go about it. Um, either I have a response to every question, or I take a couple of questions. It's your call. You are the one. Why don't you answer that? It's a very interesting question to start It off. is, it is, it is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you one, one thing, that the, that the rationale for Pakistan's nuclear capability is only one, to deter aggression against Pakistan from the east where it had faced three times. That's it. It's a defensive capability. We do not have any aggressive designs. We do not envisage any use of the nuclear weapons, period. It is only for deterrence. Sometimes these are referred to as weapons for peace. <coughs> and it has worked since 1998. Pakistan and India somehow have had that deterrence in place. But at the same time, we were equally mindful that having acquired this capability, we must remain a responsible nuclear state. So we worked very hard on that. Four domains. First, nuclear security. Let me go back. Nuclear safety. I'll come to nuclear security. Nuclear safety. We have four decades long power generation experience using nuclear fissile materials. Not a single, is there a word around? Is this a word? <laughs> That's a word. Not a single incident of any kind and any magnitude. You can check the records of IAEA under which and who safeguards each and every power generation plant is uh, in Pakistan. Nuclear security, extremely important, particularly for us, and you refer to that period, sir, when the terrorists had unleashed a war against us. Throughout that, we ensured that we have multi-layered program for security, 
and today we can say with great deal of confidence that never could the terrorists ever come close even in rhetoric let alone actions against any our nuclear assets if you check the website of iaea you will find that there are over 2765 incidents of theft of fissile material not one in pakistan not one in pakistan because we are very conscious that we need a multi layered nuclear security this is a very important respon uh, responsibility that pakistan has undertaken so we have to take and we have worked with your country let me tell you we have worked with your country i personally led my team in my previous capacity and worked with your country for nuclear security we participated in the nuclear security summit process that was president obama's initiative there were four summits we participated in that and we amended as a result of which a large number of actions were taken because of uh, that cooperation and there was a great deal of confidence that was built we also had a confidence building process with india what is called expert group on nuclear cbms the last one was held in december 2011 ever since because our dialogue is not happening so this is not happening so nuclear safety nuclear security let me go to the third element which is export controls export controls is important ladies and gentlemen because any item of dual use we neither want it to come in nor we want it to go out and we have updated our national list of export controls and aligned them with the export control list of all multi or four multilateral export control regimes to the extent that we have even announced a unilateral adherence to the nuclear supplier groups nsg guidelines so we are very conscious because we there is history to it but we we do not just do not want and if there is any talk ever of pakistan's cooperation with some country we vehemently reject that immediately come out because we don't want it to be seen the only rational as i indicated to you is defense and deterrence and the fourth area is command and control we are quite conscious that these are these weapons must not lay in wrong hands that these remain centralized in control sometimes media refers to them as battlefield weapons that's not correct that's not how we see them these are not for better full use so we have kept these centralized command and control through an institution called national command authority headed by the prime minister of pakistan so we are very conscious of this responsibility sir and we will go any to any length to make sure and united states has worked with pakistan all these years and does recognize what i am telling you and that is why there is a there is an acceptance of the responsibility that pakistan has undertaken for a very genuine reason i hope i answered that sir <laughs> yes Uh, Pakistan and the U.S. are very distinct countries, and what do you think is the biggest misconception by Americans about Pakistan, and what is your relationship with Iran? Uh, with Iran, you said Iran. Well, let me tell you. Uh, let me tell you that um, uh, in these seven decades of relationship. there have been points of convergence and there have been points of divergence which is not unusual in any relationship but somehow in pakistan people feel sometimes that the relationship with united states is transactional it's not broad based and that has been our urging on the us administration that we need a steady broad based relationship because we have a broad based relationship 
And I often say that even if you take the government of Pakistan on one side and the government of the United States on another side, and I'll identify to you scores of areas where cooperation is already ongoing and will is continuing to do that. For instance, the United States still remains the largest destination for Pakistani students. Although it is changing also in some ways because new centers have come up, new European and American university campuses have emerged closer home in different, in the Gulf countries, in Malaysia, etc. But still, thousands of our physicians have come to serve the people of the United States. And they maintain linkages with Pakistan's health institutions. And even Dr. Frahan was telling me all about the, the pursuits that he has in the, in the public health domain. IT sector, we have a young population. Hundreds of thousands of Pakistani youngsters, young men, computer scientists, are engaged with formally and informally with the Silicon Valley. Agriculture. It was only through that collaboration between University of California, Davis, and Faisalabad Agriculture University that we produced a revolution in agriculture in Pakistan during 60s by coming up with new varieties of agriculture uh, of, uh, of crops which we, we had not known. And today, it's coming back in the form of precision agriculture, where this time Harvard University actually is the, taking the lead but there are a number of uh, other universities, and particularly uh, the corporate America, which is coming into it in a big way. And likewise, trade and commerce and many other areas. What I'm saying is that it is important not to view this relationship from a small prism of one issue or the other. Sometimes it is felt that the relationship between Pakistan and United States is viewed only through security prism. Whereas the need of the R is to recognize that the, the broad-based nature of relationship actually already exists. And the two governments need to stay engaged for the sake of people of Pakistan and I believe for the people of the United States through that broad-based. Now let me uh, answer your question on our relations with Iran. Iran uh, is a neighbor of Pakistan. We have four neighbors. It's the fourth neighbor, a long border. And the Persian language has had imprint on Pakistan's culture for centuries. In fact, on whole of India. In fact, if you go back in history, Persian language was the court language for many, many centuries in India. So that influence on our art, culture, literature is evident. But at the same time, we also believe that there are areas in which more work can be done and should be done. We were, for instance, very pleased when the, the six plus one talks with Iran led to conclusion of a nuclear agreement. We were happy with that. We were happy because we have not been able to develop our relations with Iran due to the sanctions that had been imposed on, on Iran. Our bilateral trade could not blossom. We could not get, we are an energy-starved country. We are working now hard to, to come out of that, and hopefully we will uh, by next year. But Iran was a cheap source for gas for us because it was next door. It was so easy to get connected. But we couldn't because of the sanctions on Iran. So when this deal happened, we were very excited about it. We thought that now it will open the door for us by lifting of those sanctions, and we can do business with them. So our relations with Iran are just like our relations with any neighbor are. We believe that we can have. But those are so limited these days because of sanctions that there was no meaningful interactions that we, we, we had. We would love to have better relations and even more meaningful relations. There is some trade that happens, but it's very limited. Much more can be done because it's a neighbor. But so far, that has not happened. 
Sir. A bit of provocative kind of question. Be my guest, sir. That's it, Jordi. You know, it's uh, uh, taking uh, Shahid Mood, uh, Croatia, ex foreign minister, uh, uh, Lingo, he said that there, there's a trust deficit between the two governments. And the vacuum that has been created over the last few years, um, where U.S. policy has been very security centric, you know, all the way from the 50s, CETO, CENTO, and, and the collaboration that, you know, we have seen between the two countries has been more security related. And that vacuum that had been created in the last few years, where the, the, there was barely any dialogue between the two governments, where China has come in, injected huge amount of diplomacy, and the, the whole narrative within the country has shifted today. You know, there are so many unemployed people, there are so many kids out of school, and certainly there, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of joy or excitement <coughs> about you know, that money coming in and changing the, the, the whole complexion of the country. Sixty billion is a, is a large sum of money. Where do you see, you know, we're talking about all these border uh, kind of, uh, obviously, you know, you're very focused on that. But what specific initiatives will, are you talking about, are you seeking from the U.S. that will make U.S. a more relevant stakeholder in terms of future? Just one, sir. You said it. We don't want it to be just security-driven relationship. We want to, it to be what it is which is a broad-based relationship. And we go back in time on that. I, each of these strands that I indicated to you, there are scores of initiatives that are being taken in the private sector by the people, sometimes with the government support. But the governments have really not worked hard on those areas. So that's what we would actually like. You know, we have good relations with China. You mentioned that. There is no doubt about it. We have good relations. But my government wants equally strong ties with the United States, equally strong. And that's the bidding we are making. And we are so happy when GE provides for our energy products, the, the, the turbines and the, uh, and the locomotives and so on. Because we want you there. Because we think that this, relation, this country offers a lot, a lot more than people really appreciate it for. Therefore, we are very, very keen that this, the nature of this relationship is not security driven. And there is nothing that we are looking for. Uh, somebody asked me in the morning also, is there anything we are looking for? Here? No, sir, we are not, except one, your friendship, your partnership. Because that in itself is, is, is good for, for Pakistan. And we are also saying that Pakistan's relations with China and Pakistan's relations with the United States are not a zero-sum game. In fact, I go on to say that Pakistan was a bridge to China 40 years back. And it remains so today. Thank you. Some, somebody back there. Let's see. Yes. Yeah. Um, no. Ambassador, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, my question is about uh, regional uh, security cooperation. Can you talk a little bit about uh, regional security cooperation in your region and Pakistan's contributions to, to that uh, regional security cooperation? Well, um, I don't know exactly what you are hinting well, like, at. Uh, structures, uh, international organizations, like okay. NATO, what, what about All right. in South Asia? All right, okay. Uh, the architecture is changing. The, the world is changing. I was reading on the plane a book by Richard Haas, A World in Disarray. It has just come out about a couple of months back. You must have seen it. And he argues that the world which had seen a post-World War II order is now crumbling and not being replaced by another order. So he thinks that it's still in disarray before it figures out what is going to happen now. And while world is changing, Asia is also changing. And the theme that is sweeping the whole of Asia is connectivity. And the organizational structures which are now coming up in Asia revolve around organizations called SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, for example, Asian Infrastructure Bank, and many others which are now trying to 
make use of that wave of connectivity to link countries meaningfully. Pakistan and China also are riding the same wave. Of course, Chinese project of one belt, one road is much bigger, touches 130 countries. And it has, and, and you all are aware that for the last four or five years, there was a talk of Silk Road. So there is a Chinese Silk Road which starts from Eastern China, goes through the Central Asia to Eurasian landmass, and there is a one belt which starts from somewhere Indonesian islands and goes through the uh, Red Sea onto, um, onto Mediterranean. And the CPAC that we have, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, actually connects the two, the belt and the road. How did it come about? It came about because, I don't know whether it was coincidence or whether it was security driven or economic driven. My sense is that it was economic driven. In 2013, when President Xi came to power, there was a feeling that Chinese economy, which had grown for 9-10% per, for the last 30 years, was overheated and he shifted to, the, to mobilizing the Chinese domestic and consumer market. He also felt that perhaps there is an, a, a growing disparity between Eastern China, which was the hub and center of Chinese economic activity, and Western China, which was becoming less de you know, developed and home to the, you know, the Chinese terrorism. Uh, the, not the Chinese terrorism, the terrorism which is directed at China. And therefore, there was a focus to develop Western China. And when that started, they realized that Western China is now 5,000 kilometers from the ports in Eastern China. And therefore, it made much more sense if they went southward to the port in Pakistan, that not only this is only 2,000 kilometers, but they would also save the huge loop uh, from, from South China Sea all the way down to through Indian Ocean, saving 8,000 kilometers. So it made perfect sense. You can call it strategic thinking. You can call it economic thinking. But it made perfect rationale for us. Right about the same time, in 2013, the government of the present government of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif took over. Now, he also had that economic mind. So, in fact, before he became the Prime Minister, in the month of May, Prime, Premier Li Keqiang from China came over and he sat with Prime Minister-elect and they came up with this idea. This idea had been on the books for many, many years, but, but the launch came around that time. So three, four years down the line, we see that a lot has now moved on and it has given that confidence to economy both in Pakistan but also in Western China. Uh, but we are very mindful that this not be seen in strategic terms or in security terms. We believe that this project is not only for the people of Pakistan and people of Western China, but for the whole region. In fact, if you move up from Gwadar port, the first po uh, uh, destination to benefit is Kandhar, which is in Afghanistan. And we are already talking to the Chinese to have a westward extension of CPAC corridor for, for Afghanistan. The geoeconomics, not geopolitics, geoeconomics of the whole region is changing. That's what is driving the, the dynamics in Asia. And we do hope that this project that we have undertaken will benefit the whole of the region. We're very, very conscious about that. And we are moving in that phase. First was the, you know, uh, focus was on energy because we were energy shortage. So 80% of the CPAC was focused on energy and now, uh, and infrastructure. But now we are thinking of uh, moving into the next phase, which is industrial cooperation, where special economic zones will be, will be built all along. And that's where we are in negotiations with many countries, because many countries would like to come and invest uh, in those zones, making use of that Gwadar port, which is a fabulous port, uh, a deep sea water port. Uh, and uh, that can, and you can see that if you, this, this is where it is, this one. So you can see that it has a clear open sea, and it, uh, it, it will probably work. And many countries like Oman, for example, which is, which is just next door, uh, and which perhaps some of you might know, uh, was owning the Gwadar port 
uh, before 1958 when the government of Pakistan purchased it from Oman. So there are many Balochis who live here, here, and there are many Omanis who live here. So this, so they want to use all their imports and exports through this corridor. So similarly, there are many other countries who want to do that. So it's a project, we believe, for the uplift of the entire region. And it will bring prosperity to all, because it's geoeconomics, not geostrategic, uh, ge uh, geopolitics, which is in play, in our view. And that's how we would like it to, uh, to go. Yes, sir. Yes, um, Mr. Ambassador, recently the international community and the civil rights community has been raising issues about the Jihad case. And I know a state of it, uh, uh, um, Sorry, which case? A, a state was of. Uh, which case, sir? Yeah. The Jihad case. Yeah. Yeah. Hijab? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. And they've raised big issues about that. And I know that there was a stay of execution that was recently granted. A stay of execution was granted by the government, but it's still causing a lot of problems in the international community. Yeah, they, okay, not yeah. Jihad, hijab. Yeah, yeah. Somebody said hijab, which is veil. Yeah. Oh, okay, all right, all right, all right. Okay, 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 got it, got it, got it. Got it. But, but also, I yeah. read. Uh, today, some reports that were coming out saying that your prime minister had a difficult time at the Arab summit, and there were some uh, disagreements that came up, especially with the Gulf states. And uh, I just wondered if you can comment on that. They said some of these rifts were substantial. Uh, can you comment on that? Thank you. Certainly, I would. Kulbashan Yadev uh, was a uh, Indian Navy officer on secondment to Indian intelligence agency. And he had was operating from the Iranian port city of Chabaha, where he himself had made another passport by the name of Mubarak Hussain Patel. And it was with this passport that he entered Pakistan, and then he confessed that he had been there many times and had planned many terrorist activities. And with his help, we were able to uncover a big network of people who were engaged in terrorism activities in Pakistan. They first started trying him for espionage. And then they were going to try him for, uh, for the terrorist activities. Now, the focus of, because of India going to ICJ, the focus had temporarily shifted to death penalty rather than the focus on, on, uh, on terrorist activities that he was actually masterminding. So we believe that as the trial proceeds, the focus will shift back to where it actually belongs, which is why should that gentleman come into our country and create all those incidents of terrorism, which he has confessed himself by his own sweet will. So we believe that the law will take its course, matter is in the ICJ, ICJ wants to deal with it, and we will go and expose the true nature of what he was doing. The second was uh, in, the, in the city of Riyadh, where the recent summit meeting between President of the United States and the leadership of some of the Muslim countries was taking place. I am not aware of any such difficulty. Pakistan has very close relations with, with Saudi Arabia. We still maintain that. Our uh, prime minister was received by the Saudi king. They had normal uh, discussions. Pakistan is part of what is called Islamic Military Alliance. In fact, one of our generals who actually led the reversal of the, uh, of the terrorist wave in our country is now the commander. Of, uh, of that alliance uh, against terrorism. We are very conscious of that. This, our participation in that alliance is against terrorism. And because we believe that we have suffered from that, that evil, from that menace, and we would like to stay together with the international community, together with our friends, like Saudi Arabia, like the United States, like many others who were participating there in the fight against terrorism. And the last row. Uh, yes. Um, occasionally there's news reports about problems that involve the uh, Christian minority in Pakistan. And um, coming from a place of religious pluralism, that's always concerning. Uh, 
how does the government uh, protect uh, both the Islamic and the non-Islamic uh, religious minorities? Absolutely, absolutely. We are very conscious of that. No Christian, or for that matter, anyone, should be hurt in Pakistan just because of faith or even for other reasons of caste, creed, or color. We are very conscious of that. And whenever such an incident happens, the government of Pakistan reacts sharply. The people of Pakistan now react sharply also. That's not acceptable. And that is why we are now going out of our you know, ordinary stretch to make sure that this word spreads in the country, that nobody takes law into his hands, that all the citizens of Pakistan, regardless of their faith and color and creed, are equal citizens of Pakistan, worthy of equal respect and protections. We are, you know, for example, I give you the, you know, whenever some, such an incident happens or on their holy festivals, our, uh, our prime minister makes sure that he is there or all the others should attend that. We, in the embassy, for example, Easter was celebrated in the embassy of Pakistan. We celebrated that. Just to convey this message, that it matters. Uh, we have a, a rich cultural, a rich a Christian heritage of Pakistan. I, uh, you know, perhaps I don't know, I don't have, may not have that book. I presented it to St. University of St. Thomas. It was a book published on the churches of Pakistan. If you see those churches, you know, your heart will warm, warm up. And you'll say, my God, such a rich cultural heritage Pakistan has from the Christian. So there's every reason for us to be proud of uh, the culture, the Christian heritage of Pakistan. So we have to, and any democratic government, let me tell you, which is close to the people of, uh, by a very definition, is is conscious of the human rights values of, of of every citizen, for that matter. And in the last few years, we have signed on to a large number of international covenants. We have signed on to ICCPR the civil rights, ICSCR, the cultural rights, the CAT, Convention Against Torture, and many, many others. And we are now submitting those regular reports. We are now submitting ourselves before the international peer review. There's a process called Universal Periodic Review under the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. And in 2008, there was first review, and 2012, there was a second review, and another one is coming up. And Pakistan is willingly accepting all these recommendations, just like the concern that you mentioned, sir. There are many others. We are quite conscious of that. So whenever and there, there is such an incident that happens against Christians, or for that matter, any community, we take it very seriously. Because that defaces the name of Pakistan. That's not what we want to see. We want to see a pluralistic, tolerant, <coughs> democratic society in Pakistan. We have time for one more question. Uh, Ambassador, thank you so much for uh, talking to us. And uh, I actually come in from India. And you know that uh, this sort of a discussion, I think one of the most important things about the US and something that all of us take for granted is that this conversation would have been very difficult whether it was in Karachi or in New Delhi. So thank you again to Baker and uh, you know for, for making this happen. My question is this. So the U.S. has a huge diaspora of Indian population and the Pakistani population. Mm -hmm. And obviously there are a lot of challenges uh, on the border and so on. So if you had a message to give the one and a half million Indian people living in the United States, mm -hmm. 600,000 Pakistanis, mm -hmm. what would that be to foster peace in that area? Mm -hmm. My message would be that Pakistan wants uh, good neighborly relations with India. India is a very important neighbor of Pakistan. The present uh, government, the ruling party, has put it in its manifesto, election manifesto, that it wants solid, positive, friendly, cooperative relations with India. It has put it in its manifesto. And, it, and when Prime Minister Modi was sworn in, our Prime Minister went there. And then Prime Minister Modi himself also stopped by uh, uh, the residence of Prime Minister Sharif. There is every reason for these two countries to be working together as good neighbors. 
Of course, we have differences. Of course, we should address them. But that's, that's the message we need. We need to work it out. But how would you do it? You will do it only through dialogue, by sitting across the table, by talking to each other, by understanding each other's perspective. That dialogue, you know and I know, is, is held up. Is held up because India believes that A, B, C, D, some things must happen before that dialogue can happen. And my my plea to them, and I have talked to my previous in my previous position to my counterparts uh, many a times, and I have I've done that in Delhi, not in Karachi though, in Delhi and in Islamabad, that we need to keep talking. Whenever India and Pakistan want to come together. And on 10th of December 2015, we announced that we will resume the dialogue. And within days, we had this Pathan Court terrorist incident. And why do these terrorists come into action? They come into action because they don't want us to sit together. So my plea to them was that when you suspend the dialogue, you actually fulfill the very, very desire of those terrorists. Let's keep talking because they are our common enemies. They are not friends of Pakistan. We have achieved a consensus in Pakistan that Twofold. One, that Pakistan, we will not allow any terrorists to remain in Pakistan. And two, that we will not allow anyone to use our soil to commit terrorism anywhere. Now, that's the kind of consensus we have achieved. And I think it is about time that Pakistan and India actually join hands against these terrorists. They are our common enemies. They are not our proxies. They are not our friends. Their worldview is not the worldview shared by the people of Pakistan. And therefore, there is every reason for us to expect that there would be a time when India would be ready to sit and talk to Pakistan. And I, my message to them is that whenever you are ready, you will find us ready. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That is excellent. Thank you for coming.